Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks for um, attending the seminar series. I'd like to thank again the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future for the support of this seminar. And today I'm um, really glad we have Shona Howard here. Um, she's an associate professor and associate director of the Center for Conservation Social Sciences at Cornell with a joint appointment in the Department of Natural Resources and Environment and Department of Global Development. Sharon also holds an appointment with the Southeast Asia program as a visiting professor at University of Malaysia, Sarawak. As a conservation social scientist, Shorna's research examines conservation behavior, community resilience, and environmental justice. Her research blends human factors and natural sciences to improve resource management and conservation with the goal to develop a fundamental understanding of human behavior for the purposes of improving resource conservation and management. Her work spans from the Rust Belt cities in upstate New York, so as to implement sustainability within community development, to Long Island's Jamaica Bay for establishing post-disaster resilience in urban environments, to the indigenous Penan community in Borneo, in which she studies cultural resilience, how cultural identity and practices affect the community's ability to overcome adversity. So thank you very much, Shorna. And um, Shorna is going to talk today about the role of social capital and community resilience to climate change. So thank you, Peter, for that warm introduction and uh, a warm welcome to everyone for being on the webinar this afternoon on this sunny day in Ithaca, New York. Um, and also I'd like to thank the Atkinson Center for Sustainability for their um, sponsorship of this series as, as well. Um, so I am going to be sharing with you today about the role of social capital in community resilience to climate change. And uh, part of that story is the story of Binghamton and the Rusty Green Binghamton Initiative, which I will um, share with you a little bit more about in a, in a moment. Um, but we're going to really learn about how community resilience what the role of social capital is in community resilience from the perspective uh, both, both as drivers of change and as uh, communities that are recipients of this uh, change in agency as well. So first I wanted to mention that flooding is one of the uh, most frequent and costliest natural disasters in the United States. Um, the, across the U.S., uh, flood risk is uh, high, the highest of all natural disasters in terms of, of cost uh, to property, which is, which is the cumulative cost um, here from uh, data uh, from, from NOAA, as well as um, the changes that we have with climate change, the impending um, sea level rise, uh, increase in precipitation, the increase in the volatility of weather, you know, all of those uh, things combine to really um, increase the vulnerability of many, uh, not only coastal communities, but inland communities as well, um, that are at risk, not only from coastal flooding, but also um, inundation from, uh, from precipitation, from uh, flat, flash flooding, impassable roads, you know, lots of different uh, ways that communities are impacted by, um, by having too much water, by flooding disasters. And this is something that's, that's going to only increase as we, um, as our climate is, is changing as well, as we're seeing the anthropogenic effects of climate change. So um, we know that um, flooding is, is one of the um, most frequent natural disasters in, in the U.S. And to bring this uh, to our local area, um, to the city of, of Binghamton, New York, and thinking about uh, a city that is at the confluence of two major river systems, the Shenango River and the Susquehanna 
uh, river as well that join right in downtown Binghamton, uh, which is only about an hour away from, uh, from us, us here in Ithaca, New York. And uh, the city has been uh, plagued by flooding. They had a flood in 06 and again in 2011. And so you have, um, and they've continued to have uh, flooding issues even, even since then. Um, and so the, the challenge is of course, really thinking about um, cities like Binghamton that um, are river cities in a, in a sense that um, really have the river as, as uh, a cultural resource, a natural resource. Um, and the question becomes, you know, how do you, how do you live with, with water in these changing conditions in this changing climate? And uh, in the course of conducting the, the research um, that I'll share with you about today, uh, I was interviewing a, a city official um, that's charged with, um, with uh, disaster recovery and, and response and uh, asked him, you know, what does resilience mean to you in the context of flooding? And he said that the way to do that is to make it a part of our daily lives. It's building flood into the ordinary experience. He went on to say the disaster didn't start the day of the flood. It's a slow motion ongoing experience. Our perspective just tries to collapse it into a prescribed period of time, but it's always happening, it's never ending. So we have to continue to adapt. And this particular quote really exemplifies this idea of um, of, of a culture of, of resilience, of a culture of, of adaptation that the disasters don't start the day of the flood. The uh, vulnerability of places exists uh, well before um, the floodwaters hit um, and floods tend to exacerbate any uh, existing vulnerabilities or inequalities that are already, already there. So in, um, on September 7th in 2011, Tropical Storm, uh, Lee moved through Broome County. Um, it hit um, other regions of upstate New York as, as well, but Broome County was one of the worst hit um, by uh, Tropical Storm Irene, it, it, which was followed by Tropical Storm Lee. So you had um, you know, intense rainfall within a short period of time. Um, and the uh, Susquehanna River broke the 2006 flood record uh, by reaching a height of 35 feet um, overtopping uh, levees and uh, numerous flood prevention structures in, in the city. Um, and so 06 was a, was a federally declared national disaster in 06, but in 2011, it even topped, um, it even topped that and um, was also a federal disaster declaration. Um, and so we really wanted to um, kind of look back um, at this time of, of 06, 2006, of 2011, of having you know, these two major storm events in a very short period of, of time um, and, and having you know, thousands of, of people displaced, 20,000 uh, residents had to be um, evacuated. Um, and there, you can see here that Binghamton University's um, event center was turned into a um, emergency shelter for uh, many of those individuals. Um, and so there, there was a lot of uh, displacement and thinking about how communities really can uh, not only recover from this, but how do you adapt for the next, um, the next flood? So uh, with regard to managing natural disasters, you know, there's, um, both a proactive and a reactive, um, reactive approach. The kind of reactive approach really emphasizes um, response and recovery, um, whereas the proactive response really talks about and creates and cultivates this culture of, of resilience, the ability to prepare, to plan, to recover and successfully adapt to any adverse events, whatever they may be. Um, and really reducing that individual and household and community vulnerability. So, uh, you know, this is a, a key question um, and it's, it's the direction that 
um, that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has, has taken as well um, in terms of one of their goals and their strategic plan is to build a culture of preparedness that it's not just about responding to a natural disaster, but really creating a culture of preparedness for whatever adverse um, event may come along um, to communities that really require this um, uh, culture of preparedness to be there, um, not necessarily just in response to responding or recovering to particular events, but really building it into the DNA of, of communities. So uh, one of the things as a, as a conservation social scientist that I've been really, really interested in with regard to um, natural disasters and uh, how communities are adapting to climate change is, is this idea of social capital. Um, the uh, social capital are the resources that are embedded in our social structures. Um, and they're often, uh, they're there as resources to be mobilized and um, drawn upon in times of need. Um, and they're embedded in our, our relationships, um, at, both at the individual and kind of social um, unit level, like a, like a community. Um, and Putnam really um, uh, advanced the concept of social capital with his book uh, back in 1995, Bowling Alone, where he defined social capital as uh, the features of social organizations such as networks, norms, and social trust that facilitate coordination and cooperation for mutual um, mutual benefit. Um, so I was, um, you know, really interested in in finding out well what role does uh, social capital play in um, in disaster recovery and and response in um, in Binghamton as part of the Rust to Green Binghamton project. So. There are different types of, uh, of social capital. There's um, uh, bonding, linking, and bridging social capital. So the, um, if you look at the, bridge, uh, the bonding social capital, this is um, sort of the super glue that, that holds uh, people together. Their strong ties, their connections with people that are just like you. So that's the bonding, uh, bonding social capital. Really, the bonds between uh, homophilous uh, bonds, bonds between people that are very similar. Um, bridging is where you tie across communities or groups. Uh, they can be heterogeneous, um, but they're really people that are uh, maybe uh, slightly different. They may be heterogeneous. Uh, what Grenevetter uh, might call weak ties, uh, the ties that um, that might uh, bridge you to um, another individual that's um, in your neighborhood, for example, but um, not uh, your neighbor. So the linking social capital are really the, the links that occur between um, those of, of different um, social, with different social power and authority. Um, and so often linking social capital is what can convey access to resources, and the connections to people that are in power. Um, and so, you know, social capital can uh, be positive, but can also be, um, there's, there's a, a double-edged sword side to social capital as well, that if bonding social capital is really strong, it could actually be exclusive to people that are not like, uh, like you. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind as well with social capital is the, it's, it's good to have um, a balance of each of these, the linking, which, which is about um, linking to uh, kind of power structures and accessing resources. But you also want to have that bridging to people that are, that are, um, that are dissimilar, uh, that, are, that are dissimilar from you, that are um, really do bring some heterogene heterogeneity into the, um, into the network um, and Grenovetter's uh, landmark paper around the strength of weak ties, that it's actually those weak uh, bridging ties that actually convey um, access um, into resources as, as well, and that are also quite, quite important. So I just wanted to share a little bit about um, the city of, of Binghamton and the kind of narratives around the rivers and around water and the, the role that we really wanted to um, 
the, the narratives that we really wanted to uncover as part of the Rust to Green uh, Binghamton initiative. So as I mentioned, um, Binghamton is uh, what some might say is a Rust Belt uh, city. And that's really where the terminology of Rust to Green came from is really this idea of uh, of moving from a trajectory of, of rust to green, which really symbolizes um, the environment, which symbolizes uh, growth, which symbolizes economic prosperity, and really um, not uh, this narrative of uh, rust and decay. And um, and there's there's uh, uh, Binghamton was once called in the Binghamton area once called the Valley of Opportunity because it was the home of the Endicott Johnson uh, Shoe Company, which employed um, over 20,000 uh, people in the, um, in the region. It was an industrial hub of the, of the United States. Um, they were the largest producer of uh, shoes in the world um, at one point with 52 million pairs of shoes produced a year. Um, they had many small mills and heavy industry um, particularly around uh, World War II and the war, war effort. Um, they were quite instrumental in that. Um, it's the home of IBM uh, as, as well. So there's a lot of um, uh, universal uh, instruments, General Electric, Link Aviation, you know, so many, um, so many uh, sort of high-tech um, industries that at that time were uh, were rooted right in, in Broome County. Um, but with the um, uh, end of the, the Cold War, a lot of the, those businesses really saw um, sort of those defense related markets start to dry up um, and the region's population de declined by nearly half. Um, and so the region, um, in addition to really experiencing this kind of de-industrialization and depopulation um, also um, was plagued by the environmental stigma of um, two natural disasters as, as well. Um, and I, the, the photo uh, that I show here is a, is a low head dam that's on one of the rivers that um, there's a, a common uh, memory of, uh, of several individuals who drowned um, at, at this low head dam which uh, across the country, low head dams are, are quite dangerous. And um, there's a, a big push to remove these from, from rivers. But so we really wanted to find out, well, what is the, um, is that the, the narrative of, of the rivers? Um, what is, how do we build a culture um, that not only focuses on disaster, but really focuses on people's relationship with the rivers, um, the photo, um, at the top is Pops on the River, which is the Binghamton Symphony Orchestra um, performing on a float in the middle of the, of the river um, while, uh, while uh, guests uh, watch from the shore. So there's, there's some really important ways that, that um, people are connected to, um, to the river um, and really thinking about the role that the arts play in that as well. So um, the Living with Water project was really born out of this, this idea of restoring the Rust Belt. Um, Rust Green as a participatory action research initiative was launched in Utica um, in 2010 and Binghamton in 2004. And it was built as a, launched as a partnership, a university community knowledge network um, to really foster change from rust to green um, and to help this inspire and build resilient places um, and to really work with the community, not for the community. Um, and we wanted to do that through uh, community co-learning about local flood stories, about those narratives of flood risk and how we could utilize those as uh, a platform for building community resilience. So, um, part of what we did um, was to undertake a series of both qualitative and quantitative research methods, but we really wanted them to be uh, quite participatory in nature um, to really investigate the social capital, as well as, again, not just looking at the disaster, but really looking broadly at um, 
people that live in, in the Binghamton area, what are, what are their relationships with the rivers and how do we build that, that culture of, um, of resilience? Um, and we wanted to use participatory methods so that we would have active co-learning and engagement um, with, with the community. So we undertook um, narrative interviews with government and community leaders that are involved in um, uh, both flood mitigation as well as flood adaptation. We conducted a series of story circles, which are kind of listening circles, something akin to a focus group, but um, much more concentrated on listening and storytelling. Um, and we held those in a variety of locations around the city. Um, including um, a public housing building, um, a senior center um, that was flooded, the public library, a church, um, the urban farm, which was also flooded. So we really wanted to kind of go to the places in the community that were directly um, affected. Um, and then we also did community-based surveys um, using the drop-off pickup method where we um, went door to door, talked to residents, and um, to really understand their um, historical and current use of the rivers, barriers to use, uh, ways that they could connect with the um, river. And then we also did a survey of, um, of attendees of the Living With Water Play, which, we, which I'll share a little bit more about in a moment. So uh, before I dive into the results, I wanted to uh, pause and see if there are any questions. I'd be happy to take, take a few questions before we dive into what some of the results are that we found. Okay, we, we have a question here from um, Kitty. Um, how did you document the story circles as in simple note-taking, recordings, or something else? Yes. So that's a great question. So we did uh, audio record the story circle. So we worked um, with all participants to make sure we um, were transparent and ha uh, had informed consent so that individuals um, knew ahead of time that um, and, and agreed to the session being recorded. Um, and they also had the choice that if they didn't want their um, story to be part of the official transcript, that they could always opt out of that, even if they um, had originally um, decided to be part of the recording. So because we audio recorded it, we have um, transcripts of the, of the story circles. And then we um, used a qualitative analysis software called Deduce to, um, to be able to analyze and code all of the story circles. And a, a question from Devin, uh, which of the research methods did you find yielded the most insight? Oh, great question. I love that. Um, yeah, they're all so different and they led to um, different insights, but I would have to say the story circles because this um, is a method that actually comes out of, um, out of the arts. Um, it was uh, something that was originally developed by roadside uh, theater um, doing community-based work in uh, in the Appalachian region of the U.S. Um, and so we actually collaborated with Civic Ensemble to uh, to host the story circles and to train um, our staff in using utilizing this method. Um, and so I found it to be really insightful as a um, as an academic, because it's not a, a method. This was my first time utilizing that particular uh, method of data collection. Um, and the story circles are listening circles. So each person, um, you sit in a circle. Um, there are no notes. There's no computers. There's nothing between the participants. So you're literally just there with the other individuals in a circle. And you all share a story. In this case, we asked them to share a story about their experience with the flood um, in 06 or 11 or, or both. Um, and so it, it involves a lot of listening. And that's something that we don't often get a lot of opportunity to do is to, to sit and listen for one hour. Um, you tell your story, you have your three minutes, but then you're listening to everyone else for the rest of the time. So I felt like that led to some important insights that. Um, that are often not uncovered through other methods. Okay, uh, Jack asks, how did you measure social capital? 
one of the main concerns in the literature is that social capital is a collective attribute. But in surveys, people often characterize individual social ties as social capital. Yes. Yes. So there's <laughs> there's a lot of arguments in the literature about what social capital is and how to measure it. Is it individual between people, the ties between people? Is it the um, aggregate at a community level? I really wanted to look at this and measure it in terms of the um, qualitatively looking at the um, not only the relationships between individuals, but the relationships between um, organizations and between individuals and organizations. So I really wanted to to look at it at this broader um, at this broader scale, and so really looking at kind of Lynn's definition um, as well as uh, Norris Norris's definition of of uh, social capital um, and resilience as this the, these networked um, adaptive capacities. And I think there are two questions here that seem related. I think one from Colin, um, was it difficult to get participation in this research? Did you offer any kind of stipend or incentive to participate? And Ashney asked, did you encounter any barriers to gaining trust with the community members when asking them to share their stories? Yeah, really uh, both excellent questions. So. The first question was um, about how we how do we get um, individuals involved in the um, in the research and um, we did not offer a stipend, but we did offer food. So for the story circles, we offered dinner. So the first part of the story circle was that it was not the actual story circle. It was uh, thirty minutes of just eating and mingling, um, and that kind of broke the ice and and helped to develop a rapport. Um, and, you know, as a social scientist, free food is always a, a nice way to invite people into a space to talk, um, talk with you um, after sharing a meal. So we didn't do that for the interviews or the survey, but we did do it for the story circles. Um, and for the, for the play, we handed out pens. So, so if they were if they were able to fill out a pen, they got a, or fill out the survey, they got a rust green pen. Um, and, you know, but incentives can be valuable. It's a, a, a way for people to, um, you know, to, to, to establish some reciprocity in the relationship. Um, and so offering something to uh, people that you want to engage in um, partnership in the research can be very beneficial. Um, was the second question around, uh, were there any difficulties? It was around, yeah, any barriers to participation, barriers I think. To participation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, another good question. Um, you know, we did um, schedule, there were two story circles that we scheduled that we didn't get any participation in. Um, and so, you know, that's always an issue is, you know, if you build it, will they come? We found that the story circles were most effective when we were engaged with um, with the partner in organizing the story circle. So the, the two that didn't work were ones where we kind of just rented out the space and then did an open call. Those weren't as successful as when we were um, you know, uh, holding it in someone's home, uh, holding it at the senior center and working with the staff there to um, to recruit participants, um, the same with the church. So, I mean, it, it really worked. It was much more effective when we were really um, working with partners to uh, organize the, the story circles. Um, one thing that I that I found in the story circles that um, this kind of relates to the earlier question about um, like insights was in one of the story circles, someone was quite um, angry and um, was very frustrated with um, what they perceived as a lack of um, government response to, um, to the uh, flood and this individual had, had lost their property um, after, the, after the flood and they, they were quite upset about that. Um, and I don't know that the, that anger which was a very valid feeling that this person had would have come out in any other method. It definitely wouldn't have come out in a survey. Um, and maybe it would have come out in an interview, but I felt like because the story circles are really about listening, that people could 
say whatever they wanted. Um, some people expressed anger, some sadness, some hope, some uh, humor. There was some um, uh, humor in the story circles. You know, one of the uh, story circles uh, participants talked about how um, there is a, a porn store in the neighborhood and the water came just up to the door but didn't flood it, you know? So they were making a joke, like of all the places that are spared in our community, like this is the, this is what's, what's spared. Um, you know, so people had, um, they, they brought humor to this. They, they felt comfortable to express whatever emotion it was that they were feeling, even though this was several years after the flood, um, you know, people were, were still, um, you know, in their feelings about this, it, it was still quite, uh, quite prominent in their minds. And I think that that the story circle methodology really allowed those emotions to, to surface um, in a safe um, and healthy way where, where those things could could be listened to and acknowledged and heard, and then discussed. Thanks. Um, should we go ahead or? Yeah. Um... Okay. Let's see. Okay. So great questions. Um, and I'll just share with you some of the results. So these are qualitative results. So they're going to be some quotations. Um, and I wanted to share um, with you the uh, kind of themes that came out with the, with the qualitative data. What are some of the themes that, that came out? Um, one of the themes was related to um, kind of boundary spanning and how with regard to this culture of resilience that it really um, you know requires this kind of regional coordination um, not just municipality to municipality but really looking across the region um, and the New York Rising Initiative um, official that was interviewed talked about how you know with the flood the boundaries disappear and they become insignificant um, and you know many people, um, we're already working together. There was a flood task force in, in place um, and they have been working together and that, you know, builds that social capital. The fact that, um, that they, you know, have the trust that they've been working together. Um, when the flood happened, they, they had that basis from which to collaborate. Um, and this was after the 2011 11 flood. Um, so that's the, the boundary spanning. Um, the next one is about um, boundary spanning as well. The, the regional collaboration, um, you know, that, that uh, there's, there's fiefdoms, there's um, turf and, you know, you have the regional collaboration, but then after the flood, does everybody go back to their corners um, or does this type of collaboration still continue? Um, so, you know, this individual thinks, you know, Partially, it's the flood situation, but it's about getting the right people at the table and looking beyond their borders to the whole community. So again, the um, the flood kind of uh, permeates these boundaries, encourages the regional collaboration, but is it enough to really keep it keep it going? Um, another was around another theme was around communication. Um, so this government official talked about how communication was critical. That was something that they really learned. Um, from the 2011 flood that flood preparedness doesn't always address communication, doesn't train people on how to talk to each other, especially during times of crisis. Um, one of our findings, this was a really important one, was that um, in the 2006 flood, again, that was a, also a federally declared disaster, um, they had to um, do uh, helicopter and boat evacuations people did not get out of their homes in time and they had to be rescued from their roofs in some cases. That did not happen in uh, the 2011 flood because of, um, of social media, because of the reverse 911 system, um, all, of the, um, all of the communication that came about um, really allowed for early response to community members so that they could could get evacuated. 
um, and not not have to have to um, you know be evacuated off the, the roof of their house as the floodwaters were rising. So there was definitely an enhancement in that communication as well. But also this idea of well, how do um, how do the um, those that are in charge of the of the flood actually um, talk to each other as well? We also looked at this idea of bonding, bridging, and linking social capital. So let's start off with uh, with bonding. So this was a mental health professional that said, I think people come together in a flood. You would think it would be something that would completely demoralize a population, but I don't think that it did that to Broome County. People came together, people helped each other, and people learned from each one, um, learned from each other. Um, and the in this particular quote, you know, talks about that that kind of bonding that people um, people came together, they they helped each other, um, they provided that um, assistance. You know, uh, in, in the disaster literature, you know, they talk about um, the informal insurance that people have if they don't have flood insurance. It's their neighbors that are helping them get the mud out of their basement, that are helping. Um, uh, helping them bleach their their walls to prevent mold from growing you know all of these things that um that public services uh may not be able to to provide and, and and people may not be able to afford professionals to do it and so in many ways some of those first responders um are, are the 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 people that are helping to provide um assistance to one another in the immediate immediate aftermath um, also, the bridging um, social capital. This particular government official um, talked about um, how, after the 2006 flood, uh, she wanted to change the name of their town to Moxie Town because the people had so much Moxie after what they had been through. Uh, people had had their homes float down the river, just came back, and they fought and they helped their neighbors. Um, she ended by saying we have a great community and during this time i've never seen a community come together so hard and fight so hard to help each other out i've seen neighbors that hadn't spoken for years helping each other out you know so that's an example of that bridging capital you know it's not a bond with your uh, best friend or you know your coworker that you know really well but it's that neighbor that you haven't talked to but again that neighbor provides that access to something that you may not have, whether it's labor, whether it's food, whether it's um, somebody at Home Depot or whatever it may be. Um, an emergency service official talked about um, how important it is to have those relationships established well before an incident, um, as opposed to in the middle when you're shaking hands saying, hi, nice to meet you. You know, let's deal with this emergency that we have on our hands. Um, so you want to have that trust and an established relationship in place, and this gets back to that culture of um, that culture of, of resilience of really having those relationships established well before an incident versus trying to develop them in in the moment. Um, and this was something that those who had been through the 2006 and 2011 flood really remarked on that in 06, you know, these relationships weren't as established. Um, as they were in 2011. So after 2006, you know, there's a flood task force, there's New York rising, there's, there's um, you know, different types of initiatives that are there um, after the 2011 flood that really, you know, helped in this, um, you know, long-term adaptation. Um, let's talk about linking social capital. Um, this is, uh, let me unpack some of the language here. So this is a county emergency management official that um, talked about the incident management team that was brought to uh, Broome County from the fire department of, of New York City. Um, and just to take a moment to talk about the incident management team, um, one of the big changes between the two floods was the NIMS structure, the National Incident Management System. Um, which is a kind of protocol for how you would handle um, uh, having a operations center um, as the main point of contact um, so that there's a central point of communication um, that's talking with all of the relevant city and county and other municip municipal uh, governments, but is also 
in with the uh, human service agencies that are um, so critical to, um, to not only to the immediate um, response and recovery, but also to adapt, you know, sort of long-term adaptation, particularly when it comes to um, you know, organizations that are working with those, um, those in, in poverty. So the, the NIM structure was really um, something that, that was, uh, was new, was a new way of, of kind of operating and communicating around, um, around disaster management. Um, and this is an example of linking capital is where um, you had the fire department of uh, New York that came into Broome County to help. Um, and they, you know, brought many people uh, before it was, you know, three or four people working and then they were able to really ramp up to what they what they needed. Um, they, um, this was the, the fire department, um, the FDNY, um, the, the, the team that was brought in was the same team that helped um, in 9-11. And so they really came with this, you know, knowledge of, of you know, really what it means to, um, you know, to, to, to manage a team, to uh, think about the, the community during, um, you know, the, the worst of times. Um, and, and they are still in touch to this day um, with the FD and why, because of these, these bonds that they formed. Um, and as this county emergency management official said, you know, that they really helped them to organize and strategize and, and really help the community um, dramatically, um, as opposed to what they would have been able to do on their own without this, you know, external resource coming in. Um, this is another example of sometimes how linking capital could um, could be negative. Um, social capital is not always positive. As I mentioned, you know, sometimes there's, there's a double-edged sword to it. Um, this um, is a religious organization leader that um, talked a little bit about the challenge of external people coming into the community and having to get up to speed very quickly and the cost that that puts on the local um, the local people to, uh, to do that. So she said the idea was to get people in and working quickly. However, the huge flaw in that idea is that to take folks from Georgia and Texas and bring them to Broome County right after a flood, that's the worst time. At the height of a disaster, the last thing you want is to have victims trying to explain to someone who's never been in the state where their house is, what the issues are, You've got to explain what a neighborhood is. That's a big flipping problem. They know nothing about the area. They don't know which segments got hit and who was living in those segments. They don't know the resources. So we were sort of puppeting them. We were hosting them here and ended up really sort of crash coursing them on Broome County and service providers. Who you talk to, who gets what done and what neighborhoods are impacted and trying to help them figure that stuff out. They were honestly well-intentioned but they needed to work underneath our leadership and that would have worked a lot better than vice versa. It was anxiety provoking for folks and anger producing as well. And I didn't think we needed it. My strong advice all over the place was, unless everybody in the county has been wiped out, just use regular local people as volunteers. So with this particular quote, you know, she's talking about investing in the community as volunteers. Um, anytime you have a natural disaster, volunteers want to want to help. There's a lot of organizations that um, mobilize, um, but if the community is not ready to receive them, it could actually be a burden to them to be able to have to host all of these um, volunteers and to manage them. So this is actually something that um, COAD does now. COAD is community. Um, organizations active in disasters. Um, and they uh, hold uh, volunteer um, coordination sessions where they uh, simulate how they would manage volunteers in the case of a, of a natural disaster. You know, how would you um, set that up logistically? How, who, who would be in charge? How would you orient them? You know, all of these things that, um, that she's describing here you know, setting up a, a way to um, a way to do that, and that that's happening after the the 2011 flood. 
So um, the last thing I'll touch on is adaptive capacity as culture change. Um, this is something again that is um, a, a important direction for building resilience. This idea of a culture of recovery has to become part of our part of our ordinary work experience, written into job descriptions, written into policy, written into law throughout the entire organization. Again, it's this culture of recovery. Um, and even beyond recovery, adaptation, um, to really um, have it be part of the, the operating procedures, to be part of um, what it means to work in the community. Um, this official talks about how uh, between the 2006 and 2011 flood, they had a lot of training, a lot of things changed, um, things they could do differently. Um, the government stepped in as far as state and federal government. Um, New York Rising was a um, a state initiative, um, they knew they really needed to address emergency services in a different and a more aggressive way. Um, again, knowing that, that um, flooding is, is here to stay. Um, this is a bit of a longer, <laughs> a longer quote here, um, but this is from uh, urban farm staff member. The urban farm was, was flooded during um, the 2011 flood. Um, and he talks about how the most heavily damaged communities are also low income um, and you have a more difficult time responding on your own to fix up your house. You need to just move because you're renting and it's not worth it to stay where you are. So the reason we put the urban farm here and not anywhere else amongst other reason is that we're in a food desert and the closest place to buy fresh foods is probably three miles away. So some uh, context for this is that through the FEMA um, buyout process, um, homeowners have the ability to move out of high risk flood areas and receive fair market value for the, uh, the value of their home. Um, the homeowners that chose to do this, um, those properties become uh, green space in perpetuity um, and the city decided to, um, to uh, let those lands actually be, become part of the urban farm so that um, these, these high risk flood areas are now uh, green space, they're uh, part of the, the Vines uh, Volunteers Improving Neighborhood Environments uh, organization, um, urban farms. And so he says, when all these things come together, then you have an event like a flood, you see the resiliency of a project like this compared to what we would normally think of as development, which is buildings and impervious surf, imper, impermeable uh, substances and roads and sidewalks. Um, and so during the flood, um, the farm did get, get flooded. It took on uh, three feet of water. Um, but they did soil testing and everything after, um, and the soil uh, survived, it wasn't um, contaminated. Um, and so they were able to continue farming in the space, but much more resilient of a landscape than if there was a house there um, and it took on three feet of water. So very different. And, and he describes how, you know, all of these things coming together, you have um, uh, a food desert, you have uh, food insecurity, but then you have um, the, the food that's produced on the urban farm, some of, some of it is donated to, um, to a food uh, pantry that, that, that feeds those in need. Um, it also employs youth um, to provide youth uh, development opportunities and youth, youth mentorship opportunities uh, on the farm as well. And so the urban farm kind of represents this, this space where you see that resiliency coming, coming together. It's not only uh, resiliency against floodwaters, but it's also building uh, the community. It's, it's helping to develop youth. It's helping to address food insecurity and the food desert that's there in downtown Binghamton. You know, so he, he ends his quote by um, saying, you know, uh, you, you get a perfect example of the way I think. Cities should start thinking about um, urban agriculture and the planning process not in terms of, oh, well, there's an organization that thinks this is a cool idea. Maybe we could have a site somewhere, but really strategically thinking about this. Uh, look for the best use for now, what is, what is marginalized property in terms of, of development. And 
I'll take a pause before we talk about the creative placemaking aspect. So I can take a few, one or two questions before we move on to the last segment. Okay, so a question here from um, Stacy. Um, do you think you would receive similar results if you were to do this initiative in a different area of the country? What factors do you think will elicit a different response? Yeah. Yeah, I think these are, I think there are some things that are cross-cutting, um, but I think there's also some unique aspects about um, Binghamton and its, its kind of Rust Belt legacy and the um, you know, the, the impact of flooding, but I, I think that uh, some of the results that we saw around the kind of link, the importance of linking social capital and, and bridging social capital, I think those, we, we see those, fi our findings were consistent with um, what Aldrich and, and other researchers have found with regard to, to that, doing research in other parts of the country and even, even in other countries as well. Um, but I think, I mean, what's interesting about it is, um, is this, this kind of culture of the, of the community as this, you know, really prosperous city that's really, you know, um, reinventing itself um, in many ways and, and bringing people back to the river um, because there was this um, kind of exodus from the rivers because they were viewed as polluted, um, but now uh, you know that that view is really changing. People want recreation on the rivers. They want they want that connection. So there are some I think unique aspects of the of the Binghamton case um, and and individuals' relationship with the with the rivers. But unfortunately, um, you know, uh, frequent flooding is something that that many communities are are experiencing. Um, and so we're seeing some similar results across other flooded communities as well. Okay, and um, there's a question a little bit back from Manoj, um, and I think he, so um, the statement the question is, most developing countries of social organizations are highly influenced by political networks, which play, um, think a vital role to weaken the capacity of social capital and ultimately fail to establish climate resilient community. Can you share your experience on such situations? Yeah, I think that's a really valid point is that, um, you know, in, in some cases there is a very adversarial relationship between um, government and uh, community organizing and social social organization, uh, grassroots social organizing. Um, and so that, yeah, that can definitely weaken um, the, the social capital um, of, the, of the community is when you have um, threats of violence, actual uh, violence against um, individuals that are speaking out against injustices that are speaking out against against these things. Again, that that floods and other natural disasters just bring those things to the surface that are already already there, um, and so that's a really important important point, uh, which is that that social capital, um, as much as it can be built up, it can also be torn down um, by forces that um, do not want to see um, the community have have power. So that's a um, uh, excellent point because power is a is another critical aspect to all of this that we talk about with linking capital that you know those that are in power if you if you um, have access to them and they're um, you know it's a positive connection then that access to those resources and all of that opens up but if those links if the, the linkage between um, those in power and those not in power um, is not there, then that access is going to be going to be shut off. That um, a, a availability of resources is not going to be there. So it's it's another one of those those aspects that um, can go either way, um, and we we have seen um, examples of that. Um, you know what's happening in Myanmar right now um, is a, a really um, unfortunate example of uh, you know government really coming down 
on people for organizing, for having their voices heard. So that's a really valid point. Um, thank you. So um, maybe should um, continue and then sure. hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Sounds good. So I wanted to share also what we've done around uh, creative, creative placemaking um, and really wanting to think about creating this culture of, of resilience is also about the um, creating the, the strong relationships with the with the rivers in a, in a positive positive way excuse me and creative placemaking is about kind of shaping the um, physical um, and social character of a, of a neighborhood around kind of arts and cultural activities um, really kind of animating public spaces with with art with um, uh, and, and bringing people together um, to be inspired to celebrate to gather to learn um, and so this was something that we did with our um, our summer interns our Cornell summer interns that were working with Russ to Green Binghamton um, we developed this idea to um, to take advantage of uh, Live on the Waterfront, which is a week, um, and it's all local musicians that perform on Peacemaker Stage, which is right along the river. Um, and it brings people to the river. Um, and so our, our students develop these chalkboards um, and put them, um, station them along the, the uh, the river uh, wall and uh, ask people, you know, tell us what uh, the river is to you and what I, what I wish the river had as a way to really engage um, people in, in a conversation about their relationship with the rivers. Um, and then we also tabled at the event. And so we were able to kind of talk about um, you know, flood recovery, we we're able to talk about the story circles and the community survey so that we could really um, connect with with the community around these um, around these these issues. And um, people were really interested. So we did these uh, a few times and, um, you know, people were really interested to uh, hang out and and tell us a little bit about their viewpoints. Um, and we found that, you know, when we talked, when we asked um, what the river is, you know, there were a variety of different, um, different responses. Some people thought it was underutilized, that um, underutilized showed up multiple times. Um, some people said it's my life, it's peaceful, it's tranquil, um, it's life came up um, several times, it's energy. Someone was funny and said wet, <laughs> the river is wet. Um, the river is in you and me, you know, it's, you know, but then people talked about like more seating. I'd like more events like this. I'd like to have fire water like they have in Providence. Um, you know, they, they talked about like the, the opportunities there. Um, some, somebody said comparable to that of the gorges, um, which we have here. And, um, and then some people had negative viewpoints. They said, you know, it's in need of cleanup or it's too dirty to swim, um, you know, th those kind of things. Um, someone said that uh, it's part of our history, you know, so, so it was really interesting to kind of hear um, all of the different viewpoints on, on this. Um, and then also to get ideas about ways people would like to connect with with the river, um, whitewater whitewater rafting, kayak rentals got lots of check marks, um, a riverboat casino, you know, interesting uh, party pontoon boat. There's a there's a theme here with these, but you know, uh, bring back the raft race, you know, bring back you gotta regatta. Um, you know all of these all of these different um, things, but you know people clearly want to want to engage. You know they're there to listen to the music, but they they also would like to get out onto the river. Um, and some of our this our um, research assistants, our interns did intercept surveys as well of those along the river, and they said 
one of the comments that they had was, you know, the music is great, but the river kind of is in the background. It's not really part of the event. And so some, some of these um, ideas that they had really, um, really would bring back this, this kind of connection to getting back on the, on the river um, and uh, through kayaking, through canoes, through whitewater rafting, river dance parties, you know, all of these things, a floating raft restaurant, more live music. Um, so there were a lot of um, a lot of uh, you know ideas that, that people had, but it definitely showed a lot of interest. And then another humorous one at the very bottom: my dad, where is he? <laughs> so somebody lost their lost their dad at the uh, at the event, but I think they were eventually reunited. Um, this was from the community survey. Um, we wanted to find out how. Um, connected people felt to Binghamton and the rivers and 71% agreed or strongly agreed that they felt connected to Binghamton. And it was almost as high for feeling connected to the rivers. Um, and it was similar for kind of connect, uh, identifying with Binghamton and identifying with the, um, with the rivers. It was, it was higher for identifying with, with Binghamton versus identifying with, um, with the rivers. You know, but still, you know, 66% of, um, of those surveyed of the, you know, 235 people that um, houses that we went to the respondents, um, you know, that's still a, a pretty significant um, number of individuals that, um, you know, have this connection to the rivers, despite, you know, living in a, um, in a flooded neighborhood, for example. Um, so, so there is this, this connection. Um, and one of the, the uh, Civic Ensemble, which is a, um, a, a theater group here in, in Ithaca, what we partnered with them to um, take the interview and story circle transcripts and develop it into a uh, play that's based off of the words of the uh, of the the exact words of those that were interviewed. So it really brought their stories to life and put them in conversation with each other, put the interviews and the story circles in conversation with one another. Um, and so it was titled Living with Water Stories of the Flood. Um, and the, the uh, play was performed at a local, um, a local theater downtown and also at an um, outdoor court of a, of a brewery and uh, right downtown. And 87% and of uh, those that filled out the, the survey after attending the, the play said that they better understood the role that arts can play in community recovery and resiliency, and 93% said they learned something new about Binghamton's experience with, with the floods. And here are some of the direct quotes uh, for, for those, some of those that attended the play that um, they, the, the tensions kind of revealed through the dialogue that, that was very powerful, um, remembering the devastation, but it's also a reminder of preparedness and change, learning how people come together to become resilient, in the future to these types of events. Um, we had a discussion, an optional discussion that um, people could stay for after the play so that we could kind of hear their, their thoughts. Um, and someone said that that was, that was beneficial, that um, they not only heard the play and, and people's experiences um, with flooding from many different perspectives, but they were also, um, it was also an educational purpose because you know we taught the play talked about dredging, it talked about flood adaptation, you know, it, it talked about, you know, these complex subjects, but did it in the words of, um, of our interviewees and the story circle um, participants. So um, one individual said, you know, that was beneficial for me. It was educational because it's not something that's taught in school. It's only a thing you hear about or experience firsthand. And of course, you don't wanna be learning about this for the first time. Um, when you're um, experiencing a, a flood as a, as a homeowner or as a, as a renter or um, someone that lives in the neighborhood. So um, as I mentioned, the, the play, we had um, a facilitated discussion um, afterwards with um, everyone that was, was in attendance or those that decided to stay after. 
Um, and we really wanted to um, really attract a, a broad audience. Um, you know, maybe that's why we did it at the um, Galaxy Brewing as, as well, which um, has a nice little outdoor um, kind of courtyard. It was a way to, again, kind of bring attention to this issue for people that may or may not be kind of ordinarily thinking of this or that might buy tickets to a, to a play about this. So um, in conclusion, we, we did find that social capital was a key part of the adaptive capacity of, of Binghamton, that there was this, um, there were ways that they were building uh, adaptability into their culture through social ties, both between individuals and between um, organizations. Uh, we saw the bridging and bonding social capital. We also saw, um, you know, the benefits of, of, of arts-based approaches to kind of surfacing ideas and connecting to people and organizations in different ways. Um, you know, the, the, the arts are kind of a non-traditional way to connect with audiences and it really helps us to think outside of our, our boxes, so to speak. Um, and this long history of using story and storytelling as a way to connect is also um, something that uh, really helped us to understand the, the issue from different perspectives and again, to surface those um, those emotions that we might not have otherwise um, learned about through other um, data collection methods. Um, also, this idea of improving communication and cross-sector collaboration, this linking social capital, we did see agencies and organizations working together in new and different ways. Um, and uh, we saw learning taking place. So after the 06 flood um, to 2011, there were new ways of doing things. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the rooftop evacuations, the communication, you know, all of those things were uh, starkly different from 06 uh, to 2011. So it's uh, a result of some of that um, social infrastructure that the community has, um, has built at different levels. Um, there's a real need to combine um, social with the technical infrastructure that in addition to, you know, repairing the flood wall in Binghamton, which is something that um, is slated um, to be done, uh, there's also an important need to focus on the social infrastructure that that's just as relevant as the physical infrastructure. Um, one example of this was with regard to pets. So, a lot of times people may choose not to evacuate because they don't wanna leave their pets behind. Um, and in 2011, this was a really important um, aspect was having uh, kennels at the, uh, at the shelters where um, individuals could store their pets, where they could house their pets um, in a safe, uh, a safe place and not have to feel like they uh, are leaving them behind. And that was a key kind of learning after, um, after 2006 as, as well as, as some people didn't want to leave their homes uh, because of their, of their pets. Well, that means that um, kennels need to be part of the immediate response as, as well so that that's not a limiting factor for, for individuals. Um, and so, you know, decision-making is not always uh, rational or, or logical. And so really thinking about how, um, how you can bring the social and physical um, infrastructure together to, to work in concert is something that, um, that could be really beneficial. So um, I have, we probably have time for a few questions uh, before we hit the four o'clock mark, but I wanted to share um, our, our website, rustygreenbinghamton.com. I encourage you to uh, check it out if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about the um, project. And my email is there as well, if any of you um, would like to touch base afterwards. And I'd be happy to take more questions. So thank you very much for your, your talk. And um, there are some more questions up here. And one is from um, Manuel. And he asked what actions were taking after all this information was collected and maybe more broadly, how do you 
um, incorporate um, sort of this um, social resilience into a community um, that hasn't recently experienced a, a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the um, the question about how um, how do you incorporate this into a community that hasn't had um, a disaster? I think that's a, a, a very um, astute observation because as the quote said from the person that attended the play, like you, you learn about this through firsthand experience, which is not what you want, right? You want the um, you want the the capacity to be there before something something happens. So, you know, that's what um, that's what the research is really advocating now is that um, you really invest in those those vulnerable areas um, even more so. So really starting to identify what the where the vulnerabilities are in the community. Uh, not only where the vulnerabilities are, but where is the social, uh, where is the social capital, and how do you strengthen that social capital? How do you, um, uh, you know, have neighborhood groups or uh, support neighborhood organizations that are promoting these social ties? Um, you know, things like that that you're really investing in in the communities, particularly in those that you know are in high risk um, high risk areas, even if they haven't um, been subjected to um, subjected to that. Um, and so that's one way that I think um, communities could proactively um, do this. Um, one, one example of that is, um, is New York City. And um, the uh, Mayor de Blasio passed um, legislation around environmental justice to really identify environmental justice areas within the city. Um, again, those would be those areas that are right, right for uh, right for investment, right for building on the social capital that is there, um, so that you then have those those that that kind of infrastructure in place before something happens. Okay, and one more. I think we have time for one more. There's a question here from Danielle, and it echoes a question we had earlier. Um, do you have any future plans for projects in Binghamton or any other upstate New York Rust Belt cities? There's a question earlier about Utica in particular. Yes. So, um, so yes, there is a Rust to Green Bingham or Rust to Green site in Utica, Rust to Green Utica, and Rust to Green Binghamton. Um, and so, we hope to continue uh, working at both of those sites. Um, one of our most recent projects was to partner. With, um, with Design Connect, the Design Connect program at Cornell to, uh, to help design um, a, the area near Rock Bottom Dam. Um, and so, you know, hopefully uh, some of these future plans uh, are, are things that might be able to, uh, might be able to be proposed, might be able to, to move through the planning process is, is really reimagining what, um, what the areas along the river look like um, to enhance safety. Uh, these are these are projects that are quite expensive, but um, but hopefully are part of the long term planning for the for the city. Um, so those were are some of the things is that uh, student teams have been able to create designs for some of these uh, spaces, and we've gone through uh, participatory processes with the community to to really get their um, thoughts on the design and make sure the design is informed by their viewpoints. And so we'd love to see some of those things be able to come to fruition. Great, thank you. I think it's um, four now. So um, thank you so much for the, for the talk. And um, um, yeah, thanks for thank coming you. in. Thanks everyone and have a great afternoon. Yeah, you too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.